uh, solutions and we talked about some properties of solutions like uh, hypotonic, isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. Uh, and remember, this all sort of revolves around osmotic pressure and the idea of osmosis, which we also talked about. And again, osmosis is basically the flow of solvent molecules like water uh, from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentrations. And it's really because of a difference in the osmotic pressure of the two sort of sides of, say, a membrane. The osmotic pressure of a substance is uh, related to uh, really the number of particles that are dissolved in it. So the more particles, really the higher osmotic pressure that you uh, typically would have. Isotonic solutions are solutions, again, that have basically the same osmotic pressure as body fluids. And what that does, as we talked about with our uh, red blood cell, is it allows sort of basically equal sort of flow of sort of solution or, or fluid in and out of the cell. So nothing bad is going to happen. Uh, but when we get into sort of a hypo or hypertonic type solution, hypo meaning less than or hyper meaning more than, and isotonic being our basically 0.9% sodium chloride and 5% glucose, uh, we will get through osmosis that flow of uh, fluid either in or out of the cell, uh, depending if it's hypotonic. Uh, that means the cell is more concentrated than outside and everything will flow into the cell, again, causing it to swell and burst. Uh, hypertonic means the solution outside is more concentrated than inside, uh, which means inside the cell is going to basically release all of its sort of fluid in an effort to sort of uh, dilute the outside uh, solution. Um, <clears throat> We then talked about sort of concentration units, and we had uh, percent mass to mass, which is our mass of our solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. We also saw percent uh, volume to volume, uh, which is the volume of solute over the volume of solution times 100%. And lastly, our percent mass to volume. Uh, which is our mass of solute divided by volume of solution times 100%. So these are sort of three percent sort of concentrations that are sometimes used. Uh, the important one of all those usually is uh, this one here in terms of being careful. Uh, that one, usually you're given the solvent and the, sol solvent and the solute separately in terms of the problem. Uh, so you again want to make sure that you actually get the total mass of the solution and not just the solvent, which is, again, a common mistake some people make. Remember as well, if you have a percentage, uh, you could convert it into a uh, kind of conversion factor by assuming 100. And again, you could kind of solve the problem's dimensional analysis way like we talked about. Uh, we finished up talking about molarity, which is the most common unit of uh, concentration, and that is big M, which stands for moles per liter. Number always stays with the moles part, and it's always one liter. Again, you can think of this as a formula because we do solve for all three of those things. So uh, if you wanted liters, that would be your uh, moles divided by molarity. And if you wanted moles, which is a common calculation, that would be liters times molarity. So once again, if you are using molarity by itself and volume, uh, you do need to make sure that the uh, volume is converted to liters for all the units to properly cancel out correctly. Also, as we talked about, that is how I would use it in a problem and do dimensional analysis. And I would not just use the big M when you're doing a calculation because people, again, oftentimes will forget all about the liters part of it. So if you had that uh, 4.25 molar sodium chloride solution, Basically, you would want to turn it into 4.25 moles per liter of sodium chloride. That way you could clearly see both of the units when you're doing your calculation. And you'll know, hey, liters are on the bottom, moles are up on top in this particular case. You could also use it like a conversion factor as well. If you needed to, you could flip it around and do sort of a dimensional analysis sort of approach as well. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right, then let us take a look at another example, I think, here. All right, what is the mass in grams of sodium nitrate that's required to make a 2.5 liter solution that is 0.15 molar uh, 
Uh, sodium is like twenty two ninety nine. Nitrogen is fourteen oh one, and oxygen is sixteen. All right, so I want to give it a. Uh, I go here look for how many grams of that sodium nitrate we would need in this case. <clears throat> I see dealing with molarity here, which is moles per liter. Uh, we do have the volume given to us as 2.5 liters, so we have that. Uh, we also have the molarity given to us of 0.15 molar, uh, which means we have that. So again here, it would make sense. The only thing we're missing is moles, and that is good because then we could use the molar mass, right, to go to grams. Now, uh, before we do that, we again can use our molarity here. Um of sodium nitrate and I could turn it into and get rid of that big M and call it again moles per liter of sodium nitrate and again if I needed to you could flip it around and use it like a true sort of conversion factor again you could kind of see both of the units there which is really good uh, so if I'm going to solve for moles in this case it will be liters times molarity so I'm going to set it up more dimensional analysis way here. We're going to take our 2.5 liters, which we don't have to do any conversion to because it's already in liters. Uh, again, if it was in milliliters, you would need to convert it to liters here before you used it. Uh, I'm going to set it up like dimensional analysis. So just opposites cancel. So I'm just going to use it just like that there. And that's going to give me 0.15 moles per liter of my sodium nitrate. My liters will cancel and uh, looks like here, 2.5 times 0.15. Going to give me uh, 0 0.375 moles of sodium nitrate. Once again, uh, I'm not looking for moles here. I am looking for grams. So at this point, it is a conversion factor from moles to grams. And as we've done many times, uh, it is going to be the molar mass from the periodic table that's going to allow us to do that. Uh, we're going to take a little NaNO3 action there. That's uh, $22.99 for our sodium, uh, plus $14.01 for our nitrogen, and plus 3 times 16 there for our oxygen. So uh, 3 times 16 plus 14.01 plus uh, 22.99. Looks like 85 on the nose there, yeah. So 85 uh, grams per mole will be our molar mass for our sodium nitrate from the periodic table. Now we're just going to basically do a conversion between or from our moles into our grams. And once again, I'm going to set it up dimensional analysis here. So I have moles up on top. So we are going to want the moles on the bottom and the 85 grams up on top. Moles will cancel, and we'll take that times 0.375. It'll look like we're going to end up with uh, 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate there, I think. Any questions on those steps there? <clears throat> so basically what that number means is if you wanted to make this solution, uh, you would take way out about 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate, you would take enough water to dissolve it in and fill it up to about 2.5 liters total volume. Mix it really good. And you should have a solution that has a molarity of 0.15 basically standing there in front of you. Any questions on that calculation? So again, you can plug and chug into the equation. I would recommend, again, a more a dimensional analysis pro so you can see all the units and hopefully you won't miss any of the units. So sometimes it's a better method there i guess to do it all right let's take a look at another one then here all right so we have these two solutions two separate solutions and we want to know what is the molarity of each of the individual ions so why don't you give that a go so first off what is the molarity of the two ions that make that up which by the way is a sodium ion and a sulfate ion and what are the uh, two concentrations or molarities that make up this guy, which is a potassium and a chromate? 
think we talked about this. And uh, just the concentration of a particular ion that's in a solution, uh, because really if it's an ionic compound and it's a solution, um, it's a strong electrolyte, so it's not going to be pretty much together. You're going to have just the ions floating around in the solution. Uh, so that's really what you want to kind of think about here is how this guy will break apart. And basically, when this does break apart, we will get a couple of the sodium ions, as there's two of them. And we will get one of the sulfate ions here. And if you remember, we talked about, I think, last time there, the way we could kind of do the calculation quickly here is very much like stoichiometry, sort of like the mole-to-mole -mole relationship between these things. So when we look at sodium, it's a one to two relationship here between the whole thing and just the sodium ions. How that translates to concentration is we do need to take uh, two times the molarity and that will get us 2.4 molars. So the concentration of the sodium ions that are basically flowing around that solution is gonna be 2.4 molar. When we look at the sulfate, it is a one to one relationship between those two, uh, which means basically we just take one times the concentration of the whole thing, which means we have 1.2 molar of the sulfate ions floating around in that solution and the sodium ions floating around that solution. And it makes sense if you just think about it again, as we talked about last time, it's not additive, so it doesn't obviously add up uh, to 1.2. But it's sort of proportional wise, you get twice as much sodium as you do sulfate every time somebody goes for a swim there. Uh, so the concentration of the sodium ions is twice that of the sulfate ions in this case. Any questions on that? And again, a reminder that the long version of the calculation is this 1.20 moles per liter of the whole thing. And you do your mole to mole relationship. One mole of the whole thing gets me two moles of the sodium ion. There is the multiplying by two part that we did there. And we will end up with 2.4 moles per liter sodium. So that's the longer version of just multiply it by two in this particular case. Again, if it broke apart into three, then you would multiply it by three or whatever that coefficient would be in that particular case. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> when we look at uh, our other one there, again, we want to think about how it's going to break apart. So we've got a K2CrO4 O potassium chromate going to give us uh, two potassium ions floating around and one chromate ion floating around in this case. And in this case, the whole thing here is 0.75 molar. So once again, it's a one to two relationship between the whole thing and just the potassium ions. And if we take 0.75 times two, <clears throat> gets us a concentration of 1.50 molar for our potassium ions. And again, it's a one to one relationship between that and the chromate which means we take one times our 0 0.750 molar. It's a 0 0.750 molar chromate in this case. So sometimes, again, you're just focusing on the ions and you need to kind of go from the concentration of the whole thing to just concentration of each one, basically kind of multiply by the coefficient as to how many you get. Same idea here. We got basically twice as much potassium floating around that solution as we do chromate, so the concentration of potassium is twice as much, basically, as we have of our chromate. Any questions on how to get the concentration of the ions? So. <clears throat> okay, question on molarity there. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about then uh, with solutions is uh, dilution. Um, so let's talk about what happens when we do dilutions. So oftentimes we do get solutions that are really concentrated in the laboratory. And a lot of times we want to use more dilute solutions, which is kind of like the stuff that you use in your experiments most of the time. And the process of dilution is really just a process of adding more 
uh, solute. Uh, sorry, I'm saying that again. Adding more solvent uh, particles, so like water. So the process of dilution is when you add more solvent particles to the solution. And what that essentially does is it will lower the concentration of that solution uh, because basically you diluted it. So a lot of times water is what's added, but again, may not always be water that's the solvent, but in a lot of times water will be the solvent. So what happens when we do a dilution is the moles of the solute before the dilution and the moles of the solute after the dilution basically remain the same. And by the way, that is pretty much what reacts when you pull two solutions together. It's actually the solute guys that are floating around in the solution that basically do the reaction that you uh, might see. So why does a dilution really affect the molarity? If we look at really what the molarity stands for, that is the moles of solute divided by liters of solution. And remember that our solution is the solute plus the solvent. And what that means is when you go and do a dilution, you're actually increasing this number. And because that number is on the bottom, you're going to be dividing by a bigger number on the bottom, which means the molarity actually goes down as you do a dilution. And it's because you're basically making this number here on the bottom larger, molarity will go down as you do that dilution, just mathematically speaking. And that's really because you're only adding solvent. And that's why the moles of the solute remain the same because you're not adding any more of that in this case. <clears throat> So here's one way you could do a dilution. This is what's known as a volumetric flask. Volumetric usually means uh, one marking. Also usually means expensive, don't break it, is usually what that means. Um, but in a volumetric flask, for example, it has one marking, whatever this may be, it looks like 500 milliliters. So that would be our 500 milliliter marking usually two decimal places is what you take anything that's uh, volumetric. So if you're going to do a dilution, you put a little bit of water in there before, uh, put your more concentrated guy into the water and top the rest off basically with water to the mark. Give it a mixy mix, maybe not so much shaky shaky, and you will have a diluted solution at that point. Uh, again, that has a lower concentration than uh, the more concentrated guy there in the I guess pipette you could call that i suppose <clears throat> so how can we calculate dilution there is a dilution equation and most people will use this as the dilution equation which is m1 v1 equals m2 v2 m is molarity and v is volume and that is because molarity again is the most common unit of concentration um, so most people will kind of use that, and I personally use it for pretty much all situations, M1, V1 equals M2, V2. There is a more generic version that books like to use these days, C1, V1 equals C2, V2, and C is just generic for concentration. Um, so although molarity really is probably the most common unit that you'll come across, um, and you really could use this equation with any concentration unit that we talked about. You could do percent mass to mass on both sides, percent mass to volume, percent volume to volume. You could really use any type of concentration unit as long as they are both the same on both sides. So that's what the C refers to. So a lot of times, though, people will use that M1V1 equals M2V2 because of that molarity. Now, as we talked about earlier, a couple things, uh, the M1s, are really usually the more concentrated solution. So before you do any type of dilution, usually the twos or your after dilution, your more dilute one. But truthfully, it doesn't matter as long as you keep the concentration and volume that go together together so that they don't get mixed up. The other thing that's really important is a couple of things just to make sure we're clear. And that is if you are not doing a dilution, and you have molarity and you have volume, that molarity, which is our moles per liter, you need to times it by liter. So the volume needs to be in liters for it to cancel. If you are doing a dilution problem where you choose to use this equation here, uh, you can convert them to liters and it will work out fine. Or you can actually leave it in milliliters on both sides. So it will work out okay. So this is the one place where,
If you wanted to, you can leave the volume in milliliters. And that is because let's just say we were going to solve for M2 in this case. So M1 divided times V1 divided by V2 would equal M2. So if I just look at units and I took molarity times milliliters on top and then divided it by milliliters, the milliliters cancel and I end up back to molarity. So if you want to in this equation only and you're doing a dilution with molarity and volumes, you can leave them in milliliters. Um, obviously, if you do that and you're solving for a volume and you have the first guy in milliliters, you will end up in milliliters. Or if you convert them to liters, you'll end up with liters on both sides. So it's really your call. And that's really because, as I think we might have talked about last time, if you take liters times molarity, uh, you get uh, moles, which is most of the time what you're probably looking for. If you take milliliters times molarity, you get what are known as millimoles, not moles, but millimoles, kind of like moles, but to the millipower. <laughs> yeah, so that is millimoles. And that's why in this equation, it really works okay because at the end here, we're going to be dividing by milliliters. The millis cancel out and you're back to molarity, which is moles per liter. So um, <clears throat> if you're using molarity standalone by itself, not in a dilution uh, formula, make sure it's definitely in liters. If you are doing a dilution with that equation, you could leave it in milliliters. So it's your call. If you don't want to worry about the should I or should I not, just always convert it to liters. Then you'll be fine in terms of the calculation. Um, so you could do that as well. So any questions on that? Yeah. So this is a, this is a dilution equation that a lot of books you will use now, and I have probably your book as well. Um, that's the dilution equation. It's the same equation as M1, V1 equals M2, V2. It's a more generic C for concentration. So as I mentioned before, uh, you can really use any type of concentration unit in this sort of formula if you're doing a dilution. So let's say you didn't have the molarity of the solutions, but you had like the percent mass, the mass of each of them, you could throw that in there and it'll work out the same. So that's why a lot of books go with the more generic C1, V1 equals C2, V2. Uh, but most of the time, if you're really doing chemistry, I guess is the way to say that, I suppose, uh, molarity is pretty much the one you're going to see most of the time. So a lot of people will use, just say M1, V1 equals M2, V2. So they're equivalent equations, uh, but you can definitely use any type of concentration unit in there. Obviously, both the concentration unit on both sides of that equal sign and the volumes need to be the same unit, right, for everything to cancel out correctly. So they got to be obviously the same. All right, so let's take a looky here. What volume of 19 molar sodium hydroxide uh, must be used to prepare one liter of a 0.15 molar sodium hydroxide solution? So, okay, let's take a look. Uh, so just to draw sort of what we got going on here. So we have like a bottle sitting there. Nice bottle there of 19 molar sodium hydroxide. We basically want to make a new solution uh, that has a total volume of one liter, uh, which is like a thousand milliliters, right? And we want it to end up with a concentration of 0.15 molar. Uh, so again, we're going to do a dilution here. Uh, this is M1, V1 equals M2, V2. Again, the higher concentration usually on this side, lower concentration on that side. In this case, uh, we do have M1, uh, we have V2, and we have M2 basically given to us. So we can solve for V1. So kind of like the gas ones as we move it across, it's going to go to the opposite side on the bottom there. We're going to divide, gives us V1 is equal to M2, V2 divided by M1. When we divide the M1 to the other side, or just put it in the opposite location on the bottom. At this point, uh, we're going to put in our numbers. Uh, so we got M2, which is 0 0.15 molar. Uh, we got uh, one liter here. We are dividing by our 19 molar. So once again here, our molarities will cancel. And since I am in units of liters there on top, 
uh, that is the units I'm going to end up with. And if I do that, I will end up with uh, yeah, 0 0.00, we'll call it 79 liters of sodium hydroxide. That is essentially, if I multiply that by 1,000... 7.9 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, basically. So first off, any question on that calculation? So let's talk about what that number really means. So that number really means is that is how much of the more concentrated solution you're going to take out and put into your new solution right there. So that is the 7.9 milliliters that you're going to take of that more concentrated solution. I now want to make the solution. So I'm going to add some water to this. Uh, we'll just look at it in milliliters since we have it in milliliters, right? We want a thousand milliliters. Should I put a thousand milliliters of water in there? I should not. And you are correct because if I put a thousand milliliters of water in there, my total volume now is 1,007.9 milliliters, which is too much. So we oftentimes are asked in dilution problems, like how much water should we add in there to do this? And that can be found by taking, in most cases, the V2 minus V1. V2 is the final volume we want, which is 1,000 milliliters. We already put in there about 7.9 milliliters in this case. And that's going to get us something like, I need to toss in there 992.1 milliliters of water. So that is what I would put here, about 992.1 milliliters of water. I would then give this a nice little mixing, right? And I now should have a total volume of one liter or a thousand milliliters. And that solution now should have a concentration of 0.15 molar. Any questions on that? So, yeah. Uh, you could actually do it uh, in this case either way. Probably if this was, say, a, a book problem or some type of problem like that, um, they, you would probably give the answer in liters since that's what the other unit was in. Um, but technically, it didn't really ask for any specific unit. You could give it for uh, either one. Here, I just actually converted it to milliliters so the numbers weren't a lot of zeros and stuff like that, as we were talking about. Uh it would be okay. So you could have done something uh, like uh, 7.9 times 10 to the 1, 2, minus 3 liters. And that would give you your two sig figs. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right. So, again, it's important when you do a dilution here, again, uh, you want to make sure you don't over dilute it with too much water when you're actually making this solution, which is a common error. People just go, oh, 1,000. I'll just dump 1,000 in there. And again, you end up obviously with too much volume and your molarity will actually change, right? Because now you have more volume than you should. All right, let's take a look at another one here and see what volume of water is needed to prepare 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar calcium nitrate solution uh, from a 5 molar uh, calcium. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so once again, if we kind of draw what's going on, uh, we have a more concentrated solution here of calcium nitrate. And by the way, it's calcium nitrate and calcium nitrate. So no reaction happening. We're just doing a dilution here. Uh, we have one that is uh, five molar here. We want to again end up uh, with a solution that has a volume of 500 milliliters and also a concentration of 0.25 molar. And obviously 0.25 is smaller than five. So that's going to be our diluted solution. So if you just kind of list everything there, M1, which is the more concentrated is five molar. V1, we do not have. That goes with it. Uh, M2 is what we're trying to make here, a 0.25 molar. And V2 is the total volume that we want to make in this case. Uh, so once again, here, we could do our M1, V1 equals M2, V2. We have everything but uh, V1. So we could divide this to the other side. Again, it's going to end up in the opposite location on the bottom there. That's going to give us V1 is equal to M2, V2, M1. Here, I'm going to put in my numbers. So I got M1, uh, M2, which is 0 0.25 molar. 
Once again, as I mentioned in this particular formula, you can leave it in milliliters. So that is what I'm going to do here. Or if you want to convert it to liters, you could do that as well. So it's okay. Uh, the difference is if you convert it to liters, when you get your answer, it will be in liters versus what I'm going to get, which is going to be in milliliters here. And we're going to divide it by M1, which is phi molar. And again, this is why it works out in this case, molarity on top and bottom cancel. So that leaves us milliliters there on top as our unit. So everything's actually okay. Uh, we will end up with here uh, 0 0.25 times 500 divided by, not multiplied, divided by five. Going to give us, uh, looks like 25 milliliters. That is 25 milliliters of our calcium nitrate solution. And that is really 25 milliliters of our more concentrated calcium nitrate solution that we're going to take out and put into our new solution that we're making. So that's going to give me 25 milliliters. Is that the answer in this case? It is not the answer because they're not looking for that amount, but they're looking for the water in this case, which is a very, again, common question that's asked in dilution problems. So in this case, we can figure out the volume of water by taking our final volume, which is V2, minus what we put in there already, which is V1. And that would get us 500 milliliters minus our 25 milliliters we already put in there. That means to finish this guy off, we need about 475 milliliters of water to go in there. So the rest here would be 475 milliliters of water. At that point, that will give us our total volume of 500 milliliters that we're looking for. And if you give it a mixy, mixy, shaky, shaky, maybe a little shaky, shaky this time, uh, you will end up with a uh, 0.25 molar solution in that case. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Question on dilutions, yeah. So typically speaking, if you happen to solve for M1, that usually is the concentration of the more dilute solution. Uh, if you solve for V1, that's usually how much of the more concentrated solution you're going to use in your dilution. If you solve for M2, typically that is the concentration of the more dilute solution. And if you happen to solve for V2, that would be the total volume of your diluted solution that you made. And again, although we use molarity here in all these examples, as I mentioned before, you could use any concentration unit in this formula if you're doing a dilution. Again, as long as they are the same units on both sides, so everything cancels out correctly. Any questions on dilutions here? <clears throat> all right. Uh, we're going to talk about the one thing that we skipped there at the beginning of your notes or towards the beginning of your notes, and that is equivalence. So we could talk about it now that we talked about molarity. So equivalents are really uh, another sort of unit of solutions that um, not use all that much, but it's something that they teach us with. So uh, equivalents are sometimes used um, to describe solutions Uh, concentration. And there's really kind of two common equivalent type units that we come across in terms of concentration. And that usually is equivalence per liter. Our, uh, not that, our, uh, milli equivalents per liter. So these are two common sort of units, kind of similar to molarity. And we're going to talk about molarity here in, in relationship to these guys. By the way, that is really just the milli conversion. Uh, and what I mean by that is there's a thousand uh, milliliters in a liter, right? Which means in one equivalent, there should be how many milli equivalents? About a thousand milli equivalent. So you can kind of use a similar sort of conversion. It works the same. It's basically just the milli conversion there of a thousand uh, when you have to kind of go from one to the next. This kind of looks like uh, molarity, which is moles per liter, uh, which is our molarity. And uh, we can actually go from molarity to equivalence uh, based on using really a conversion factor. And where we get the conversion factor is from 
the actual ions that are in the solution and actually their charges that are in the solution. So basically the number of equivalents equals the number of the charge. And it doesn't matter if it's a positive charge for the ion or a negative charge for the ion. Uh, so for example, if I had a calcium ion floating around in the solution, I could come up with a conversion factor that says for every one mole of calcium ions, I get two equivalents. And the two comes from the charge. If I had a sulfate ion that is floating around in the solution, I could say for every one mole of my sulfate, I would also get two equivalents. So it doesn't matter if it's a positive charge or a negative charge. It's actually just the number in this case that's the important part in terms of equivalents. Uh, if I had an iron three ion floating around in the solution, one mole of my iron three, would give me three equivalents. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Uh, it's it's just another, um, it's another unit that is sometimes used, not very often anymore, but it used to be used for concentration of ionic compounds because ionic compounds, when they're in a solution are strong electrolytes, which means you really have just the individual ions floating around. So sometimes people will apply that because they do have charges and that charges are related to those equivalents. It's also very similar to when we pull things off the periodic table, right, for these things. It's the molar mass. You could also calculate the equivalent mass, which is how many equivalents per uh, mole there is as well. So it's just another, I'll say older sort of system of using not too much of that's used, I would say, in everyday sort of life Um they do use some of this on some IV bags, equivalents and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, again, molarity is a very common unit uh, that you see the most. But there is a relationship between the two. And we'll see how we can kind of go from one to the other and sort of figure out the concentration and equivalents uh, per liter. So let's say we had a solution of 0. Uh, uh, Zero points, we'll go five molar sodium sulfate. And we wanted to uh, figure out what is the concentration of the sodium ions in that solution and the sulfate ions in that solution uh, in both equivalents per liter and milli equivalents per liter. So we have the molarity of the solution and we want to kind of turn it into the sort of equivalents per liter and milliequivalents per liter of really the ions that are floating around the solution, uh, which is sometimes what people will kind of do this for. So let's take a look at how we could kind of do that. And I'm going to uh, switch the page here. So I got something for us to write on. So when we rewrite up on top, so we went with 0.5 molar sodium sulfate. And again, we want to know the sodium and the sulfates equivalents per liter and milli equivalents per liter. All right. So first off, we really want to know what is the concentration of each of these ions in solution, which we did a little bit earlier, I think. Uh, so when this sodium sulfate breaks apart in solution, it will break apart into a couple of sodium ions and a sulfate ion, right? Now, again, if the concentration of the whole thing here is 0.5 molar, my concentration of the sodium ions in this case would be, it would be one, and that would be found by taking basically two, right? It's a one to two relationship times the 0.5 molar, and that gives me one molar for my sodium ions. Now, if I do it for my sulfate, it is a one-to-one -one relationship between the whole thing and just the sulfate, uh, which means we would take one times our 0.5 molar, which gives us 0 0.5 molar of our sulfate. So these are really, if we have this sodium sulfate in solution, 
uh, that's really what is floating around. That is the concentration of the sodium ions floating around in that solution. That's the concentration of the sulfate ions that are floating around in that solution. Any questions up to there? So this is important because frankly, this is really just like a conversion is what we're doing. We're just kind of changing it from one concentration unit to another. So we'll start with the sodium. And first off, when I have one mole of a sodium ion in that solution, how many equivalents should I get? The charge is plus one, which means the number is one. So that would be one equivalent. Again, for the one for the charge. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Again, here, it's just a number. And we're going to use that as a conversion. So how this works with molarity is, if I take just the sodium, that is one mole per liter of sodium ion, right? That is essentially what that represents right there, right? So I want to eventually end up with equivalents per liter. So I could use what I just did here as a conversion factor. And I want to get rid of moles, which means on the bottom should go one mole of sodium gives me one equivalent of sodium ion. The moles of sodium will cancel and that will now give me one equivalent per liter of sodium ions. Yeah. And there is this concentration and equivalence per liter. Any questions on that? <clears throat> By the way, if we want to convert it to milli equivalents per liter, and one equivalent, there is 1,000 milli equivalents, which means I will end up with 1,000 milli equivalents per liter in my made up example here of sodium ions floating around in that solution. So this would be the concentration, not in molarity, but in equivalents per liter and milli equivalents per liter for the sodium ions that are basically floating around the solution. It's really just a different sort of concentration unit rather than molarity. It's equivalence per liter because it has charges in their electrolytes. First off, any question on that calculation? <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to look at sulfate, which is the other ion that is floating around in that solution, right? So if we look at the sulfate, for every one mole of sulfate, how many equivalents will I have? Two equivalents, again, the number, right? So if we start with the concentration of sulfate in that solution, and again, we're gonna get rid of the big M and call it moles per liter. This is gonna give us uh, 0 0.5 moles per liter of sulfate. I'm going to use my conversion that I just put there and get rid of moles. So one mole of sulfate gets me two equivalents of sulfate. Moles of sulfate cancel. And that gives me one equivalent per liter of sulfate in this case, which I can also convert to milli equivalents by times in it by a thousand. which gives me 1,000 milli equivalents per liter of sulfate in this case. Question on that calculation there. Are the concentration of these ions that are floating around in the solution and equivalents per liter and milli equivalents per liter, are they the same or different? Concentration equivalents per liter is the same for both the positive guy, right? And the negative guy, which is why we balance out the formula, right? So we got equal positive negative charges floating around in that solution. And they should always come out the same, by the way. If you ever calculate equivalents per liter for a positive ion and a negative ion in the same solution, they should always end up the same because all the positive charge, all the negative charge should balance each other out. So that's why they actually end up the same for both of those units. They have different molarities, but in terms of equivalence per liter, which is based on the charge of each of those things, 
that balances out the charge of each of the ions that are in that solution. The question is all out there. So why don't you try one? Let's do uh, what is the equivalence per liter and milli equivalence per liter of a K3PO4 solution that has a molarity of, uh, we'll do 0 0.025 molar. All right, so what is it for the potassium and what is it for the phosphate? Let's see what you come up with. I will too, since I made it up, we'll see how we do here. Okay, let's take a look and see how you're doing. Uh, so once again, we want to kind of figure out how this breaks apart. So we have K3PO4. Uh, it will break apart into three potassium ions, as that three will come in the front. And we will end up with one phosphate ion in this case. Now, in terms of our molarity, we were given 0 0.025 molar. So when we look at the potassium, it's a one to three relationship, which means for the potassium, it's going to be three times our 0 0.025. Two five zero, and that will give us our zero point zero seven five molar. For our phosphate, it's a one to one relationship, which means we take one times point zero two five gets us zero point zero two five zero molar there. All right, so now that we have the concentrations, we could now convert them into really this. Uh, concentration unit that's based on the charges of each of these ions that are floating around in the solution. So we'll start with the potassium here. And I know that for every one mole of potassium ions, I should get how many equivalents? One equivalent as that's the charge is one. And we're going to use that really as a conversion factor. So we'll start with our concentration of the potassium in the solution, which is 0 0.075 moles per liter. We want to get rid of moles, so we're going to put the one mole of potassium on the bottom and the one equivalent up on top. The moles will cancel, going to give us a concentration for our potassium ions floating around of 0 0.075 equivalents per liter of potassium here. Once again, we could also do the conversion to milli equivalents by taking one equivalent is 1,000 milli equivalents which will get us 75 milli equivalents per liter of potassium here. First off, any question on either of those calculations there? All right, so if we do it for our other ion that's floating around that solution with the minus three charge, we could do it for our phosphate. And in this case, for every one mole of phosphate, its charge is minus three, which is really the three parts important, will give us three equivalents. Again, it is the three that's important there. So doing our same idea here, we're going to start with the concentration of our phosphate in the solution, which in this case is 0 0.025 moles of phosphate per liter. Using our equivalent conversion here, one mole of phosphate, gives us three equivalents and the moles of phosphate will cancel going to give us 0 0.0750 equivalents per liter of phosphate. Once again, you could see because this is a balanced ionic compound, charges balanced, the equivalents are based on charges. They end up with the same equivalents per liter in terms of their concentration. And once again here, they will also end up with the same Milli equivalents per, li per equivalent liter. Equivalents will cancel. Going to get us our same 75 milli equivalents per liter of our phosphate. Question on any of that calculation there. So again, this is a, a concentration unit that's used for solutions of ionic compounds because there's ions spun around. They're electrolyzed. They have charges and it should always be balanced, which is the idea of an ionic compound. And also the charges should be balanced, right? Which is how we put an ionic compound together. We make all the positive charges equal all the negative charges. So we end up with a zero overall charge. So basically the charged ions floating around the solutions uh, 
all have the same concentration, so they all cancel each other out, and we don't have extra charge floating around in that solution. Any questions on equivalence? Uh, so basically just a conversion factor based off the number of the charge and use really just to convert something from say molarity to equivalence per liter or backwards. You could go the other way as well. No. Question on solutions, yes. Uh, say, say it again, how can I nip at the three where? Mm -hmm. At the very top. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is an ionic compound. So whenever you have an ionic compound, they should never have an overall charge, right? But they are made up of two ions that have charges. And that's basically, that formula is achieved by what we talked about when we talked about naming, right? We have a minus three and a plus one, which means that to balance this out, we need three of those. And that gives us our ionic formula, which always should equal zero. And really the reason for it should equal zero is what we just saw here in this calculation. That way, when those guys are floating around this solution, they both, we both have the same, there's basically the same sort of positive charge floating around as there is the negative charge in terms of the concentration of those guys in that solution. Other questions? <clears throat> Okay, uh, we're going to uh, pick up here uh, chapter 10, uh, which is acid and bases. It is the last chapter, not of the season, unfortunately. It's not the last one of the season, but uh, it is the last chapter before we get into our organic chemistry. I'll try to, I'll try to work through it. I'll be all right. All right. Uh, so last one here with, with calculations in our calculator. Then we're going to put it away for the rest of the season, only to bring it back out for exams and quizzes. But uh, uh, so we're almost to the part where no more calculations, more just memorization, naming, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but there is a good amount of calculations in this chapter to end us on, uh, which is, of course, yes. Uh, there you go. So uh, acid and bases here. So let's talk a little bit about it. And let's talk first off just a little bit. I think it's a good idea just to uh, talk a little bit about acids and how we name acids, just so you know how to name an acid rather than just saying, you know, that thing there, just whatever that might be. Uh, so when we actually name uh, acids, uh, it all involves really... Uh, how you go about naming it, it's all really dependent on whether or not there is oxygen in the actual acid. And if you look at an acid, uh, acids are really aqueous solutions. Uh, so acids typically will have the AQ symbol next to them. And every acid is thought of as being really almost like an ionic sort of compound, even though it's technically sharing electrons. Uh, but the cation for all acids is H plus. So um, cation, if you remember from our naming talk, right, is the positive ion, right? So in all the cases, it's H plus plus something that's negative to balance it out, uh, makes our acid. So if you have an acid that uh, has no oxygen, the way that you name those is, uh, those are the guys to start with hydro, something ic acid so if you had something like hcl that has the aqueous symbol next to it that tells you that it is an acid rather than hcl with a g next to it which is a gas um, that would be hydro the missing part is really the negative guy there which is the chloride so that would be hydrochloric acid you had HBr, also again, no oxygen. So that would be hydro, middle part there is the negative guy there, which is bromide. So this would be hydrobromic acid. So if you have a acid uh, that does not have oxygen, that is always how they start with hydro. They have ick at the end there. And the middle part's really the negative ion. In the case of HCl, this is really H plus and Cl minus together. So that's the negative ion there would be the chloride ion. Now, if it does have oxygen, it will contain everybody's favorite thing, which is those polyatomic ions. Are not. Yeah. 
So if you remember, those polyatomic ions pretty much end in one of two ways, a majority of them. They either end in eight or eight. Those are basically their kind of main two ways that they end. So if you do have oxygen in your acid and your polyatomic ion ends in eight, the acid name is something ic acid. So if we take something like HNO3, NO3 is NO3 minus, which is nitrate. And this would be nitric acid. Again, NO3 minus, which is nitrate. ATE, IC at the end. If I have H2SO4, SO4 is sulfate, which means this is sulfuric acid. Why is there two hydrogens in this case? The sulfate has what type of charge? Minus two, so you need not one of those H pluses, but you need two of them to balance it out like a normal sort of ionic compound in this case, yeah. Um, and again, that SO4, two minus is sulfate, uh, which gives us all our sulfuric acid in this case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, if your polyatomic ion or your acid does have oxygen and your polyatomic ion ends in ite, it is something OUS acid. So if we take HNO2, NO2 is NO2 minus, which is not nitrate, but it is nitrite, I-T-E. This then becomes nitrous acid, O-U-S. If I had H2SO3, this is SO3, two minus, which is not sulfate, but that is sulfite. This would be sulfurous acid. So that is the way that you name acids. It's really all, bless you, dependent on whether or not you have oxygen involved. We also see that hydro is only for acids that do not have oxygen. So there is no hydronitric acid or anything like that. Yes, people like to put hydro on everything. Seems more chemistry like if you just throw hydro on everything, but uh, should only be for acids that have no oxygen. Uh, ones with oxygen don't put the hydro on it. Yeah, so you know, doing those things. Any questions on the two second naming lesson there? Yeah, yeah. now you can say, like, I know what that acid name is. Hopefully, I don't know. all right, so let's talk more about you know, sort of these acids and acids and bases in general and uh, some of their properties here in this chapter. <clears throat> Everybody good? Yeah. All right, so let's talk about some of these characteristics. First off, acids, they have sour taste. Don't taste any acids or bases in lab, all right? Um, they cause uh, litmus paper to change. So litmus paper is sometimes used uh, with solutions to determine whether or not the solution is acidic, basic, and typically, if you have uh, blue litmus paper and it turns red or any litmus paper that basically turns red stays red, uh, that's usually acidic. Uh, they also react with certain metals to produce hydrogen gas in a single replacement reaction like we talked about. Take a little zinc plus some hydrochloric acid. The zinc's going to come in and kick out the hydrogen. That's going to give you your hydrogen gas plus your zinc chloride that will be made. Put it to there. This is a single replacement reaction. Remember, we talked about this with our redox reaction. Is basically what's happening here. That is an exchange of electrons or a transfer of electrons that's happening here from the zinc to the hydrogen ion. 
uh, aqueous solutions conduct electricity, uh, aqueous acid solutions conduct electricity. So they are electrolytes. So uh, strong acids are strong electrolytes and weak acids are weak electrolytes as well. They're able to conduct electricity. Bases on their hand have a bitter taste. Uh, they feel very slippery. Most soaps, drain cleaners, things like that are bases. If you ever get it on your hand, it feels like you have a layer kind of on your hand and stuff like that. I don't recommend that either unless it's soap. Um, but uh, they also will change litmus paper. Uh, so if you have red litmus paper there as it shows and you put some solution on it and it turns blue or stays blue, uh, blue is pretty much basic uh, when you're using litmus paper. Also, you can have some strong bases, which are strong electrolytes and conduct electricity really well, uh, just like what we talked about with electrolytes. So let's talk a little bit about acids and a couple important aspects of it. First off, an acid is a substance that has the ability to produce H plus ions in solution. So first things first, with acid-based chemistry, our friend the H plus and our friend H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion. That is the hydrogen ion. They are basically the same. So you can use H plus, you can use H3O plus, and they're interchangeable both in formulas uh, reactions and so forth. Personally, I use H plus most of the time. Uh, books tend to use H3O plus. So pretty much anywhere I put an H plus, you could put an H3O plus and it's basically the same thing. It is basically the acid part of the solution. Now, uh, H plus is also called a proton as well in acid-based chemistry. And that is the hydrogen ion. And that's because hydrogen has one proton, right? Has one electron. How many neutrons does hydrogen have? Zero. Yeah. So it only has a proton and an electron. And the way somebody becomes positively charged is they lost what? An electron, which leaves it just a proton, which is why it's called a proton. Yeah. So hydrogen, because it's plus one, how to lose its only electron, leaves it a proton. See, these things make sense, I suppose, if you think about it that way. <laughs> All right. So uh, we do call them protons. We call them hydrogen ions. And some people call it the hydronium ion. If any of those three words are used, uh, pretty much everybody's talking about the same thing. They're pretty much talking about the acid part of the solution. There are strong acids, which are strong electrolytes, which means that they, much like strong electrolytes, 100% break apart in solution. So there's a good list of strong acids, which is a good one to sort of know. It sort of helps eliminate the question of, is it a strong acid or is it a weak acid? So a list of strong acids are as follows. There's the partial list there on the screen. Uh, we have hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, and perchloric acid. These are basically your six there of, <coughs> excuse me, your six of strong acids. And pretty much if it's not one of those, you could probably make a pretty safe assumption that it's a weak acid. So those six are probably a good one to kind of uh, know. And uh, because they are a strong acid, like our nitric acid, what that means is when you have nitric acid in solution, it will 100% break apart into hydrogen ions and nitrate ions. So 100%, that is what you have in solution. You have none of these guys still there, which means if you dump some nitric acid into here, you just dumped a bunch of H pluses that are floating around and a bunch of nitrates that are floating around. And in terms of acid base, it is that free H plus or free H3O plus, which is really important for something to be an acid. So that is really what the, an acid is. It has the ability to produce that free H plus ion floating around the solution, not attached to anything, just kind of floating around freely. And it comes from that. So that's why strong acids are strong electrolytes. And that's why they are strong acids because all they have to do is go for a swim. And as soon as they go for a swim, they're gonna break apart. 
and you're going to have a bunch of H plus freely floating around in the solution, which is going to make it a acidic solution most likely, and obviously affect the pH, as we'll talk about a little bit later on in this chapter. Question on that there. <clears throat> now, bases are uh, <clears throat> bases are substances that can produce hydroxide ion in solution, and most strong bases. Uh, come from group one and two on the periodic table. And if they are somebody from group one and group two on the periodic table and they have hydroxide in their formula, it's probably a strong base. <laughs> Frankly, if you look at group one, oh, let's see if super zoom keeps it. I mean, there we go. If you look at group one, there's like lithium, they got like sodium, and you got a little potassium there. You hang up right there. You got some calcium uh, and so forth. So if you take any of those guys this way and then down into group two and you have OH with them, probably going to be a strong base. So potassium hydroxide is a strong base. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. Uh, any of those guys really in group one and group two. Group one is the alkali metals, right? Group two is the alkaline earth metals. The word alkaline means basic. Yeah, so alkaline means basic. So alkali, alkaline earth metals, group one and group two on the periodic table that have hydroxide in them are pretty much where our strong bases come from. And just like our strong acids, if you have a solution of sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base, in solution, it's going to 100% break apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So again, 100% is what you got in the solution. You got none of those guys together. So once again, if that goes for a swim, you're going to generate a bunch of sodium ions, which is not really important, but it will most importantly generate some free floating hydroxide ions. And it's those presence of hydroxide, just like the H+, freely floating around, not attached to anybody in solution, uh, which makes it a base. And it will also affect the pH and make the, really that solution probably basic as well. So an acid is something that has the ability to really give away an H plus or sort of produce H plus in solution. And a base is something that's able to produce OH minus or hydroxide in solution. Any questions on that there? And once again, that is why they're considered a strong base because all it has to do is go into the solution and you generated a bunch of OH minus really quickly. And that's going to make it really basic, that particular solution probably. So what happens when we take a strong acid and a strong base? I think we talked about it when we were talking about types of reactions. Really, whenever you take any strong acid and you react it with a strong base, you basically get two things. You get your salt and you get water. Salt's an ionic compound, and water is H2O. And basically what is happening in this case is, for example, if I took hydrochloric acid and I reacted it with sodium hydroxide, this is a double displacement reaction, right? Positive, negative, positive, negative. That means my positive H is going to go find my OH, and that is how we make water. And then my sodium here will go find my chloride, bless you, which will give us sodium chloride, and that is my water and salt in this case, yeah. So always in a strong acid, strong base, it is the... Strong acid giving the H plus, it is the strong base giving the OH minus, and we are making water. That is the fundamental thing that is happening when you put together a strong acid and a strong base together. You made water. And if you remember, one of the three reasons why any chemical reaction takes place is the making of water. So that is basically why that reaction takes place. It is under the big umbrella, like we talked about, of double displacement reactions, these acid-base reactions. So they fall under that double displacement where our two positive ions switch partners, 
And the ultimate reaction here is really just the formation of water. And that's why it's sometimes referred to as an acid-based neutralization reaction, because basically you made water as a result of it. Any combination of strong acid, strong base you put together, you always get the salt and water. So if you took nitric acid and you took uh, potassium hydroxide, that is a strong acid. That is a strong base. Here's the deal. It's always the H from the acid. And the OH from the base is going to make my water. So that is what's going to produce basically my water on this side. And basically what's left is you're just going to put those ions together. And that is so uh, that's potassium with a plus one and nitrate with a minus one, which means when we put it together, we get a little potassium nitrate action happening. And there is my water and there is my salt, which is the ionic compound. So literally you can take, put your hand over the H and the acid, your OH from the base, put your hand over, that gets you your water. And then whatever's left, put them together properly, like you're doing nomenclature with an ionic compound, and that will give you your salts. So it's basically just a double displacement there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> And again, uh, as we talked about there, the ultimate uh, reaction that's happening really is the formation of water. This is really what you got going on in solution. You got all these ions floating around and really the sodium ions on both sides are just hanging out. The chloride ions on both sides just hanging out. Ultimately, what is happening and leading to that reaction as we've been talking about is the H plus from the acid, the OH minus from the base kind of come together there to form our water in this particular case. That's why the sodium, the chloride, which is the salt part, is sometimes referred to as spectator ions, because if you're a spectator, you're doing what? Just watching, and that's what they're doing, yeah? They're just hanging out, floating around, having a good time, balancing out the charges, not really forming anything. They're just floating around, and they'll still be floating around as water's being made, uh, so they're not really doing anything, and again, that's why we kind of cross them out and not worry about them. It's about really what's happening is again, that H plus and OH minus is coming together uh, to make that water. Here's a couple other examples there. Uh, again, as we see, uh, these are both our salts and obviously our water that's being formed as a result of those reactions. Now, sort of the early definition of acid and bases is really the one that we just were talking about. Uh, Arrhenius here discovered and did a lot of work with electrolytes, which again are those guys that break apart and produce ions in solution. And he basically said that an acid is anything that has the ability to produce H plus ions in solution. And again, as we talked about, it is being able to produce that free floating H plus, not attached to anything. And a base, again, is something that is able to produce the free floating hydroxide ions in solution. Not all bases, as we will see, actually has hydroxide on them, if you will, uh, but they can produce hydroxide. So an example, for example, here, ammonia, which is this guy. Ammonia is actually a weak base. And as you can see from ammonia, it does not have hydroxide. But what happens when you have ammonia in water is ammonia will actually pick up a H plus there from the water. And the result of that is it will make NH4 plus, And more importantly, it will then produce hydroxide, right? So because it's able to do a little reaction there with water, for example, it's able to produce some hydroxide. Ammonia is considered a base, but it's considered a weak base because it's got to frankly do some work to produce the hydroxide. And that is different than a strong base like we just saw with sodium hydroxide. All the strong base has to do, as I mentioned, is go into the pool there, go for a swim and it will automatically produce hydroxide because frankly, it's carrying it with it. It's got hydroxide on board. All it has to do is just release it when it goes in. 
ammonia has got to go find somebody, do a little reaction to produce that hydroxide. So that's why it's a much weaker acid than, say, sodium hydroxide. But it's still, I'm sorry, it's a much weaker base than sodium hydroxide. But it is still considered a base because it still has the ability to produce some hydroxide. We also see these arrows heading in both directions. We saw that with a, what type of electrolyte? Weak electrolyte, yeah. And that is what ammonia in a weak base is or a weak acid. They're weak electrolytes. So as we talked about, weak electrolytes mainly stay together but break apart a little bit. So it's able to produce a little bit of that hydroxide in solution. So again, still considered a base, but definitely not as much as a strong electrolyte, which has a one-way arrow, right? Everybody's dumping out to the product side, going to produce a lot of hydroxide really, really quickly. Any questions on there? <clears throat> By the way, that's how you make hydrochloric acid is you take some hydrogen chloride gas. And that is why when we have HCl with a G, that is hydrogen chloride gas. But when you bubble it through some water there, you get HCl with the aqueous symbol, which makes it an acid. And that's hydrochloric acid. And our sodium hydroxide, hydroxide there in water as well will break apart. So it was a really good sort of uh, step in terms of definition of an acid and base. And it's really still a, a good definition of an acid and base. Uh, but he really did focus in on one type of base, which are guys that are really are kind of strong bases that have the hydroxide in them. And as I just showed you with the ammonia, obviously things do not need to have hydroxide to be a base. So a more generic type definition of an acid and base and one that most people think about when we talk about acid and base is the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid and base. And the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid and base is an acid is a proton donor, which is somebody that gives away an H+. And it's really important to remember, especially when we're talking about Bronsted-Lowry sort of pairs and conjugate bases and all these things, it's not just the hydrogen, but it is H plus, and that plus has an effect on the charges, right? So if you lose something that's positive, you become more negative, right? And obviously um, the opposite there is true. If you gain something that's positive, you become more positive. So the charges of things are affected as that proton gets donated from one place to the next. A Bronsted-Lowry base is something that will accept a proton. So if we go back to the example I just did there where I had my ammonia and my water, and we made this. The water is actually donating the H plus over, which means in this case, the water is acting as the Bronsted acid. The NH3 is going to accept the H+, plus, which means it's acting as the Bronsted base. Yeah, And the consequence of the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid of base is they will create partners on the other side of the arrow. So when we look at the other side of the arrow, this guy and this guy is related to each other. They look kind of the same, right? And that is the base on the left, which means this is what is known as the conjugate acid. And the water here and the OH are related to each other. That's the acid on the left. Is partner on the right-hand side there is the conjugate base. So when we have a Bronsted-Lowry acid and base, they will always create partners on the other side of the arrow, which are referred to as the conjugate acid and conjugate base. How do we tell if they are related to each other? It is all based on what happened here on the left-hand side. The water did what? Donated an H+. Plus. So the only difference that you should have between the acid on the left-hand side of the arrow and the conjugate base on the right-hand side of the arrow are the base on the left-hand side of the arrow and the conjugate acid on the right-hand side of the arrow is that one hydrogen. That one H plus is the only difference that there should be. So when I look at 
my base to my conjugate acid, it has one more H plus because it gained it. And when I look for my acid to my conjugate base, it has one less H plus because it gave it away. So that is how you can tell the difference between your, or if these things are related to each other, acid and conjugate base or base and conjugate acid. The only difference that there can be is one H plus difference and that is it. If there is more than one H plus difference, if there's some other element difference, they are not related to each other. Because the idea here is one should give away an H plus and one should accept the H plus. By the way, your regular acid and bases are always found on the left-hand side of the arrow. Your conjugate acids and bases are on the right-hand side of the arrow. So uh, that's the relationship there. Question on that there. So this is, again, our general reaction here. HA is just a generic acid. It could be any acid you like. But again, this acid is going to be related to the conjugate base. And this is our base that's going to be related to the conjugate acid. And in this case, this guy is going to donate the H plus over. And as you can see, the difference between this guy here and this guy here is one less H plus. So again, this is what I was talking about in terms of the charge. We started with something that is HA, no charge. I got rid of an H and a plus. So I got A left over and had no charge. I lost a plus, I become one more negative. So the charge of the conjugate base changes because again, it's not just the H by itself, that plus affects the charge. When I look at the water to the H3O plus, that has one more H plus. That also changes. I started with water on the left. I added an H plus, which means I ended up with H3O plus one to something with no charge ends up with a plus one charge. So it's really important to keep track of the charges as you're writing these pairs. But once again, the only difference as we go from left to right is that one H plus that basically gets transferred question on that there. That is what is sometimes referred to as a conjugate acid base pair. And that 1H plus is all the difference there could be. Now you may have in a situation, a spectator ion that's just hanging out and you still may just be that 1H plus difference. So for example, if I had HF and NAF, are those guys related to each other? Well, NAF is an ionic compound, which is basically a sodium ion and a fluoride ion, right? Now, if I get rid of the sodium, are these guys related to each other by 1H plus? They are. So sometimes you will have like a spectator ion we were talking about earlier hanging out there. And commonly things like sodium, potassium may be there. So if you get rid of that guy and just kind of look at the two ions that are left there, again, it should just be that 1H plus difference in that case. Those guys would be pairs in that case. And the pair would be the HF and the F minus in that case. So our conjugate acid base pair, again, are two things that are related to each other. But again, the only difference there is our H plus. If we look at our hydrochloric acid dissociated in water, in this case, the HCl is going to send the H plus over. When it does so, the HCl and the Cl minus are related to each other. Again, the only difference between those two is one H plus. If you're not sure, you could take the Cl minus and add an H plus to it. You get an HCl and plus one, minus one gives you no charge. You get back the guy on the left if you want to do it that way. Our water here is going to accept the H plus, And that means that this water and the H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion, are also related to each other. Once again, if you add H plus to this guy, you get H3O plus. So again, these two guys are only a difference of one H plus, and those guys would be pairs. Any question on that there? <clears throat> All right, so again, this is sort of what's happening in that reaction. It's gonna go grab its uh, H plus, and it's gonna make H3O plus.
what we're really looking at in this reaction is really just the strong acid breaking apart. So um, if you write it like this, without putting the water in the reaction, you will end up with H plus and Cl minus. And that is the exact same reaction as if you put the water in the reaction. You will end up with H3O plus and Cl minus. As I mentioned earlier, these two guys are essentially the same. So the reason you get H3O plus is sometimes people and a lot of times books will do it is they will put water in with the acid, which is not necessarily necessary because it's going to break apart anyways. But if you do put the water in on the left-hand side, you will make H3O plus on the right-hand side. If you show the strong acid like this just breaking apart, you'll just have the H plus. So again, they basically represent the same thing. I personally... It's because of the way I've learned it over the years. Uh, I will probably use H plus most of the time. So again, anywhere I put H plus, you could swap it out for H3O plus. But that's really how we generate H3O plus. It's the Bronsted uh, Lowry definition where uh, water is going to pick up the H plus from the acid. And it's really what's happening in both of those equations. It's the same thing. It's just that strong acid going for a swim and breaking apart, basically, in water. All right. Let us finish here with this one. Which one of these represents pairs or which ones of these represents acid conjugate base pairs? Once again, we're looking for only a difference of 1H+. plus. Is the first one a pair? So I'm looking at this and this. What is the only difference between these two? It is a H plus, right? Maybe, yeah. And if I put the H plus on this, I end up with this guy, right? And if I take the H plus off of this, I end up with that guy, right? So however you want to look at it, whatever is easiest for you to see. So they are pairs. The only difference there is one H plus. How about number two, or is those guys pairs? The difference between these guys is an H plus, but there's also a difference of an oxygen, which that guy does not have, right? So that would not be a pair in that case. How about H2PO4 minus and HPO4 two minus? Yeah, the only difference there is an H plus. Again, however you want to look at it, you could put the H plus back on that and you should get this guy or take it off and you should get the other guy. So that would be, and lastly, this guy would be yes as well. Again, the only difference there is an H plus. So it looks like everybody on this slide, there's a pair except number two. Any questions on that?